Shalom. All praises to the Heavenly Father, Apukuya. Praise be to the Earthly Mother, the Pachamama, and all of her Earthly Angels, their Kadeshwe. Praise be to the Holy Spirit, the Kahe. In the name of Famashiach, Mats of the Lamb, Unification to the Nation. So, guys, this video, man, listen, it's, it's taken me a while to take to bring out videos because, you know, the Heavenly Father, he just dropped a lot on my plate all at once with a lot of this information. And I'm struggling how I'm going to present a lot of this information. See, for whatever reason, he has me talking about uh, Western Europe again. And this is just kind of how I do things. I kind of just move with the spirit. The spirit's kind of leading me towards Europe again. So that's where I'm moving. And I'm absolutely shocked with what the Most High has showed me. And I'm pleased to be able to share it with my brethren. Right? So, I also want, I just wanted to share um, a message that I actually got in a dream the other night. And I'm dead serious. I, I don't play around with stuff like this. I don't say that I got a message or anything happened to me when it really didn't like listen i don't do stuff like that but this is the exact message that i got um i was just dreaming and i felt like a a, a being speak to me i couldn't see this being i can only see it speak and a ray of light moved up and down mm, excuse me like a like a a radiance of light moved up and down with uh this person's speech it was kind of it was kind of a deep ish voice a tad deeper than mine but it was a soothing deep voice um i just felt like it was trying to get my attention and it waited like it was, it was like looking at me right until i looked at it back and once my attention was fully on it it told me the following quote i don't know what this means so this is why i'm laying it out here in this video i'm gonna make a video later on in the week uh, regarding what I think it means right but I want you guys to help me out with this quote the Hispanic Giants were in sea before they were on land their children were known as ants end quote now if anyone knows what this means please let me know but that's the quote that I got from this being I woke up I was like what the hell was that and I was just like you know what I'm gonna forget this let me write it down and I wrote it down, went back to bed. And then I forgot it even happened until I looked back at my phone and I saw the note. So let me know what that, what that means and your opinion. So I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on the map that I have of the Holy Land. And it's, it's not that much different, but I'm pretty sure that <laughs> these, are, these are at least Manasseh. Manasseh and Dan, I'm going to show you why I say what I say. Reuben and Gad, uh, we're still going through that, but I'm, I think that we might have the right places there. I'm still trying to find where the Ammonites are, right? As well as the Amorites. But I have a hunch, right? So that's my map right now. Let's get into the video. We are in Joshua chapter 19, and we're going to start at verse 47. And the border of the children of Dan went beyond these, because the children of Dan went up to fight against Leshem, and took it, and they struck it with the edge of the sword, took possession of it, Ooh, excuse me, and dwelt in it. And they called Leshem, Dan, after the name of Dan their father. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Dan according to their families these cities with the villages so they named this place Leshem they called it Dan after the name of their father right well let's find out what 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 is what is Leshem wait a minute oh man hold on <laughs> yeah okay Leshem means precious stone, right? A city west of Mount Hermon. Okay, whatever. Um, but it's also called Laish and later Dan. P 
pay attention to this this is very important and this is very important as well precious stone Lashem that's what it means right let's go to something real quick because I told you guys a theory of what I thought that England was before and that still stands true right Let's go to, let's duplicate this real quick. And let's go to Strong's 8659. Tarshish, which means yellow jasper. They don't really know what stone this is, but they know that it's referring to a stone. Right? So this is somewhere that's accessible uh, by the Red Sea. Or to the Red Sea. Right? This is also an island of tin. It was a, it was a, it was a place where the Phoenicians mined tin in. We already went over this, right? So I'm asking, is La Shem, is La Ish, and Tarshish all the same place? I think it is. Now let's get to what La Ish means. La Ish literally translates to lion. An early name for, down, for Dan is... A town in northern Israel. Hmm. You know, what is the national symbol of England? It is the lion. Particularly the lion and the unicorn. And we're going to find out exactly what this means. Tribe of Dan Laish. La the portion ass assigned to the tribe of Dan was a region west of Jerusalem. West? How is it what? All right. At least part of the tribe later moved to the extreme northeast and took the city of laish renaming it dan as the northernmost israelite city it became a port of reference in the familiar phase from dan to bathsheba the northern most part right the northernmost israelite city right it means lion now let's get into detail on how the tribe of dan overtook Laish. And why did they? In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in. For unto that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. So they didn't even have an inheritance. They took their inheritance afterward. Right? And it seems as if they took someone else's inheritance. Skipping down, you guys can read this chapter. Again, it's Judges chapter 18. 27. And they took the things which Micah had made, and the priests which he had, and came unto Laish, unto a people that were at quiet and secure. And they smote them with the edge of the sword, and burnt the city with fire. And there was no deliverer, because it was far from Zidon, and they had no business with any man. And it was in the valley that lieth by Beth Rehob. And they built a city and dwelt therein. And they called the name of the city Dan, after the name of Dan, their father, who was born unto Israel. Howbeit the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the children of Dan set up the graven image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh. That's very important. And his sons 
were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. So there is some sort of connection with the tribe of Manasseh and the tribe of Dan. Well, how could that be? They're in Laish. They're in the most northern part of Israel. So that would mean that they're not west of the Jordan, that they're east of the Jordan. Right? And they must be near the tribe of Manasseh. Well, hold on. I'm saying that England has to do with the tribe of Dan. Am I not saying that? And of course, there's some sort of a reference to the tribe of Judah as well. But the tribe of Judah had cities in every single city. If you read the scriptures and you match up Joshua 15 with a lot of the different allotments that the children of Israel were given, they were given land or Judah was given land in all the different in all of the Israelites tribes. Right. If you look. So, the, the tribe of Judah was in almost every single tribe in all their lands. But the, son, the, the sons of Manasseh must have been close by. Right? Let's continue. Because it said, what, what happened? What they named Lashish or Laish, they named it Dan. Okay. Danish people or Danes, people with a Danish ancestral or ethnic identity. Danish language, a northern Germanic language used mostly in Denmark and northern Germany. Danish pastry, often simply called a Danish. Danish tongue or Old Norse, the parent tongue of all northern Germanic languages. So, where's Lash, where's Laish? Where was it extended to? Because a lot of these lands were connected. That's something to also note. Um, so we don't necessarily know what the landscape looked like before today. Right? A person from Denmark. However, during the Viking Age, the word Dane became synonymous with Vikings. Did I not cover the fact that the tribe of Dan is connected with the Vikings? That raided and invaded England. So, was England always known? There was a symbol always known as a lion? Was it? Hmm. These Vikings consisted out of a col a a col a col a, col a colonization. I hope I said that right of Norse warriors originating not only from Denmark but also Norway and Sweden so the tribe of Dan <laughs> they mixed in with a lot of these different quote-unquote tall white peoples and they came and they invaded England at some point what is the coat of arms of Denmark You'll notice that it's literally exactly the same as the coat of arms of England. And I was watching someone explain this coat of arms, and he was explaining the fact that these lions are not regular lions. These are supposed to purposely look like snakes. To differentiate between the Judaic lion and the Danite lion. Right? Danish laws formed the basis of the Dane law and gave the name the Dane law to an area in North and East England that came under Danish control uh, in the latter half of the of the 9th century. The Viking raids uh, culminated in uh, 1013 uh, CE when the Viking king uh, Sven Forbeard, Fork, uh, Forkbeard conquered the whole of England. The tribe of Dan mixed in with the other nations, right? With these other peoples who I think are Canaanites. And they betrayed us in a major way. In a major, major way did these people betray us. Now, 
Now we're going to take a break from the tribe of Dan and the Danes because we could go into much detail about this, but that's not what this video is about. This video is about Gog and Magog. But that was necessary to say. Why? Because they have a connection with the tribe of Manasseh. With Joseph, the sons of Joseph, the sons of Dan and Joseph, they connect. But in what way do they connect? Well, let's go back. Who was Gog Magog? Now, Gog Magog, he was a, a, a British legend of a giant, right? I'm just laying out that preference. We're going to read that again, but I'm just laying out the preference. The names Gog and Magog appear in many ancient historical texts and those of different religions. They are often linked to the end of days and the apocalypse, which, are, which is not the same. Sometimes, now this is very important because this is a fire, fire, fire line right here. Sometimes Gog is a person and Magog is the name of the land. So, the name Gog Magog is not supposed to be talking about one person or two people. Is not Gog Magog is not one singular giant. It seems as if Gog is the giant or the person and Magog is the place or the land. So when we're talking about Gog Magog, are we really talking about Gog in Magog? And people, they, they don't necessarily know. They're trying to figure out what is Gog Magog like. They don't know, right? A lot of this stuff is conjecture. When you really look at a lot of the stuff that they say. But this was a fire bar right here. I'm telling you. Because there's, there's a lot to back this up. Let's get into it. Gog Magog, or Gog in Magog, was the last of the giant's found by Brutus and his men inhabiting the land of Albion, which was, which is uh, what England or Britain was called before. The effigies of Gog Magog and Corineus, and we're going to go over him, used in, Eng in English pageantry and later instituted as guardian uh, statues at, at uh, Guildhall in London eventually earned the familiar names Gog and Magog, and that's wrong. They're trying to list this person, Corinius, as Magog, and Gog Magog as Gog. Right? When Corinius is not a giant, we're gonna go in. We're gonna get into that right now. But let's go back to Gog, Magog. Gog Magog was a legendary giant in Welsh and later English mythology, according to Jeffrey's Monmouth's Historia Regum. Uh, Britain, something like that. The history of the kings of Britain the 12th, in the 12th century. He was a giant inhabitant of Albion, thrown off a cliff during a wrestling match with Corinius, a companion of Brutus of Troy. Gog Magog was the last of the giants found by Brutus and his men inhabiting the land of Albion. Right? So, let's recap. Gog Magog, which is really Gog in the land of Magog, was the last surviving giant in the country of, of England, but what was known as Albion. He was defeated and thrown off a cliff by Corinius, who was a company uh, or companion of this other person. Of Brutus, right? So you have Corinius and Brutus, or Brutus, right? Now, this is where this book, Sowers of Thunder, man, it only takes one paragraph. It only takes one paragraph. Now everything's about to make sense. Check this out the word og or gog is also recognized as a pre-Christian term for a great pagan deity connected with sun worship, hills, and stones. Do you guys realize how fire this is? You know what this just said. 
It just said that Gog is Og. Do you guys know who Og is? Come on, man. Let's skip ahead. Let's 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 show you who who is Og. Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Edri. And the Lord said unto me, Fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into thy hand. And thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Shihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. Now, when you read other books, it tells you how the Israelites killed Og. Because the Israelites didn't kill Og. Moses killed Og. Moses killed Og. Now this book that I have in my library is called The Lost Book of King Og. Now I don't know what the heck happened to this book. But I have a lot of pages missing all of a sudden. And it's very very annoying. Because I did not know that before. I'm, I'm very annoyed because look at all these pages that are missing that are all in white. They're all missing, bro Super upset. I don't know if I even have this book anymore I am very perturbed, but it is what it is. We'll just have to read what we have here This is all I have here. So if you guys have this book, you know Please let me know if you're willing to scan it at least like if you have it and you know You're not willing to, to rescan it then you know, whatever but if you're willing to rescan it and you want to know how to, let me know. But we are going to start here. I think this is page 90, 96. I would like to know how it said that uh, Moses killed Og. Because that would tie everything together. But anyway. My spies say that when you killed King of Shihon, you killed the women and children keeping the spoils. Your corrupt fecal god has driven you mad. You know, let me say this like Og. Your corrupt fecal god has driven you mad. Murder, slaughter, destruction. At the hands of Israel. Of war madness. Drunk with the blood and spoils. Enemies learned. Life is still lost even when the battle is won, worm. I will release the floating wild beast. The Gontigua. To you, O oh corrupt fecal worm Israel. Learn to suffer its ways of connection from before your time, before your flood, before your Nimrod, we were there, from the time of monsters, from the time of the bright ones, my brethren in the field, their livestock, and the greater beast of old, creeping, cloven-footed, hoofed monsters that dwelled in the blank blank, the giants those men of old with powerful, dark ones, connected in heart and mind, and unstoppable before the gods. One mind, of one heart, they ruled. These men of old, and their beasts driven before them. Beasts that controlled the men, as the men controlled the beast. O oh, stupid, corrupt fecal worm Moses, learn to fear the heart of an animal and the mind of a giant. It is time for you to share your being with something greater. I want no victory spoils, just your stupid head. Train for strange weapons. Make war, little man. Make war, corrupt little worm. For by all of the earth I'll spread the blood, virgin body. I, Og, have been training each arm as one trains their oxen. My old world... Back and legs are ready. My life is to you, fecal worm. I will tear your backbone, your backside. For by all of the earth, I, Og, will pull the fecal, bearded, smaller, self, child skull of Moses from your dung-filled body. I, Og, the last of the Raphaim. How long Moses has to live? I have not summoned such anger since the thousand hundred thousand giant war so that's pretty much what happened with uh you know og and moses so Og he was popping that good ish to moses 
Then Moses, he I don't know how how he uh slayed Og, because this page is missing, but you know he slays Og, right? But before then, he just explained the one hundred thousand giant war. Now a lot of pages are missing, so I don't know, but <sighs> I actually think uh, Big Judah um made a video about this, the hundred thousand giant war, and that's pretty much how these giants died. They died from this war, right? The Most High made them self-destruct. And these were not just giants. Like, this is not like the same mound builder giants of the northeast of, of North America. Not like the Jaredites. No, this is literally titans. Like, like titans, nigga. Like, come on. <laughs> you know? So, this is what happened. Og is the survivor of the uh, 100,000 giant war. He is the last one of that war, of that area. Not of the whole earth, that area. Because the Anakin were still around. We were supposed to kill all of them. Right? We hunted them. Right? So, Gog Magog, or Gog of Magog, or Og of Magog, is the last survivor of the giants of the titans really and who else is the last survivor Og of Bashan right are they the same place Corinius threw a Gog or Og off of the cliff now let's find out what the Talmud says about how Og died you guys are going to get a kick out of this The Jewish Talmud embellishes the story, stating that Og was so large that he sought the destruction of the Israelites by uprooting a mountain so large that it would have crushed the entire Israelite encampment. The Lord caused a swarm of ants to dig away the center of the mountain, which was resting on Og's head. <sighs> Excuse me. The mountain then fell onto Og's shoulders as Og attempted to lift the mountain off himself. The Lord caused Og's teeth to lengthen outward, becoming embedded into the mountain that was now surrounding his head. Moses, fulfilling the Most High's uh, injunction not to fear him, seized a stick, of, a stick of ten cubits length and jumped a similar vertical distance, succeeding in striking Og in the ankle. Og fell down and died upon hitting the ground. And I, Og, died when I smacked against the ground. That hurts my voice, bro. I can't do that. Let me let me catch something for you guys. Because I googled something real quick on my phone. How did the giant Og Mag uh, Gog Magog die? A place in Cornish legend. Corinius Corn killed Gog Magog, the greatest of the giants inhabiting Cornwall by hurling him from a cliff a cliff near Totn Tot uh, Totnes, Devon is still called Giant's Leap wow <laughs> wow so let's go back to Corinius right so Corinius is the founder of Cornwall now what is Cornwall We've gone over this and I believe in previous part we definitely should have gone over Cornwall. But if not, it doesn't matter because I'm not gonna go over it um in great detail anyway. But check this out. It is the homeland of the Cornish people, right? The Cornish people. Now let's look at who the Cornish people are. The Cornish people are a Celtic ethnic group and nation native to or associated with Cornwall and a recognized national minority in the United Kingdom, which can trace its roots to the ancient Britons who inhabited southern and central Great Britain before the Roman conquest. Many in Cornwall today continue to assert a distinct identity separate from or in addition to England and British identities. Now let's show let me show you what these people look like because uh these people are an incredibly mixed up group, but
but but even so you can see that their lineage comes from something that is pretty dark let's show you some pictures these are Cornish people right now in the book ancient and modern Brit Britons it talks about how pretty much the Br the British people you know particular and I'm guessing he's really talking about the Cornish people they're a mixture at first at first they were a mixture between Australoids this is what he said they were a mixture between Australoids and tall white people and they formed the Mediterranean look you know the the Iberian look pretty much now the mixture between that Iberian Mediterranean look and the modern day white people gave you this look but you could say that their lineage goes back to something that is melanated right I'm just putting that out there because these are Cornish people who are darker skinned and they tell you out their own mouths that they are darker skinned with darker hair they almost look like gypsies in a way who are also descendants of probably the lost tribes of Israel. So, I'm just putting that out there. Um, Quirinius, or Moses, if you didn't figure that out, founded Cornwall. And his companion, Brutus and his army, or Joshua and his army, were also there. How's that? <laughs> How's that? Did I miss anything? No, I didn't. Now, we are in Hosea chapter uh, 7, verse 8. Ephraim, he hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Actually, whoa, whoa this is, should be at the end. Excuse me. Sorry about that. <laughs> now we are in Joshua chapter uh, 9 verse 10 and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan to Shihon king of Heshbon and to Og king of Bashan which was at Ashtaroth bro this is probably the biggest part of this lesson this is even bigger than the Og uh, slash Gog connection Ashtaroth. Right? Let's look up what that is. In the Strong's Concordance. Ashtaroth means star. False goddesses in the Canaanite religion usually related to fertility cults. Now let's look up what Ashtaroth is or who was Ashtaroth? Wait a minute. He is a male figure most likely named after the near goddess Astarte. That's the one I wanted, not Ashtaroth, Astarte. Astarte is the Hellenized form of the ancient Near Eastern god Ashtart, um, a deity closely related to Ishtar, worshipped in the Bronze Age through classic antiquity. The name is particularly associated with her worship in the ancient Levant among the Canaanites and Phoenicians, but where's the ancient Levant really? Though she was originally associated with the Amorite cities. Amorite. And we're not going to get into the Amorites this video. But I just want to get, I just want to, you know, just touch on this real, real quick. Because what does Amorite mean? Because the term Amorite 
It means Westerners. Westerners? Well, why would the Amorites be called Westerners? It's not like they're in Western Europe or something like that, right? Anyway, that's for next video. Or in the next part. I don't know when part 7 is going to come out, but... That's for the next part. But Astarte is connected to Ishtar. Or Anana. Um, Ishtar or Anana is an ancient Mesopotamian goddess associated with love, beauty, sex, war, justice, and political power. She was originally worshipped in Sumer under the name Inanna and was later worshipped by the Akkadians, Babylonians, and Assyrians under the name Ishtar. She was also as the Queen of Heaven. Right? She was the center of... Uh, or she was associated with the planet Venus and her most prominent symbols included the lion here we go with this lion again the lion of Babylon so is that lion that we're seeing is that the lion of Judah or is it the lion of Dan and the eight pointed star Come on, bro. That's why it was talking about how Ishtar or Ashtarot or Ashtarti means star. Well, let me look something up real quick. Hmm. I thought that okay, because I was thinking that the um okay never mind never mind never mind, but I do know that there are stars all over like as far as Jew Jewism and stuff like that. But I don't know if it's necessarily the same thing, so I won't include that. I'll be fair, but we don't need that, right? Because what did it say? What did it say here? A false goddess in Canaanite religion usually related to a fertility cult, right? Okay. Fertility rites are religious rituals that are intended to stimulate reproduction in animals or in the natural world. Such rites may include the sacrifice of a primeval or, or, or primal animal, excuse me, which must be sacrificed in the cause of fertility or even creation. So there you go. This is done with magic and alchemy and things of that sort. Fertility rites. Let's look up what fertility cult means. A pagan religious system of some agricultural societies in which seasonal rites are performed with the aim of ensuring good harvest and the future well-being of the community. Seasonal rites. What is Stonehenge used for? Is used to calculate when the solstices and, e and equinoxes were. You see, this is why we had to overtake back our lands. We didn't build a lot of these me megalithic structures. We used them so we could, you know, figure out when our calendar was and things of that sort. But that's not why uh, these giants were using them. You see, when you flip righteous things into wickedness, you get a sort of power out of it. And that's what the and that's what they were doing. They were flipping righteous things into wickedness. That's what they were doing. So that's why the Most High wanted us to get them out of here, because they were not just doing that. They were pretty much terrorizing the world. They were terrorizing everyone else. The Most High used us, the Israelites, to save the world, and that's why he he's going to use us again to save the world from these same descendants of these giants, the descendants of the Rephaim.
we're gonna we're gonna save the world from the white people the same white giants who are here today terrorizing the world now there's a reason why I'm bringing this up because what did it say what did it say regarding uh you know in Sowers of Thunder I said it was associated with a deity associated or connected with sun worship hills and stones hills stones sun worship that's stonehenge bro that's stonehenge right now what did we just go over with fertility rights they included animal sacrifice right ishtar is also the god of fertility where was uh og and bashan he was an Ashtaroth or Ishtar Roth. And Ishtar is particularly associated with the Akkadians or the Assyrians or the sons of Japhet or Magog. I'm putting this all together in real time, bro. The chief Babylonian and Assyrian goddesses, goddess, associated with love, fertility, and war, being the counterpart to the Phoenician Astarte. Right? Or what some people say is Baal. So that would mean that Babylon must be associated with Western Europe. Babylon and Assyria must be associated with Western Europe in some way. Let's move down. I gotta go I gotta go to the bathroom, bro. I'm not gonna lie to you. My stomach kinda kind of hurting right now it's okay other uh pro uh propit propitia propitiatory i hope i said that right sacrifice took sacrifices took place at intervals and at a general or tribal character the victims being criminal criminals or slaves or even members of the tribe. The sacrificial pile had the rude outline of a human form, the limbs of Osir, enclosing human as well as some animal victims who perished by fire. Deodor Deodorus says that the victims were male factors who had been kept in prison for five years, and that some were in, were and some of them were impaled. This need not mean that the Holocaust were uh, uh, Quinn. Yeah, I don't know, but they may have been offered yearly at midsummer to judge by the ritual of modern survivals. Hold on. <laughs> Wasn't this done by seasonal rites? This was done at certain time periods, right? This is why we were taken down, by the way. This is what the Druids were doing. This is what some of our people were doing. When it says that we copied Canaan, we mixed in with Canaan, it was very serious about that. And how we were doing the same wickedness. It sounds just like the Aztecs. Sounds like just like all of us. The victims perished in that element by which the sun god chiefly manifested himself. And by the sacrifice, his powers were augmented and thus growth and fertility were promoted. These holocausts were probably extensions of a earlier slaying of a victim representing the spirit of vegetation. Though their value in aiding fertility would be would still be in evidence. This is suggested by Shrabo's words that the greater the number of murderers, the greater would be the fertility of the land. Probably meaning that there would then be more criminals as sacrificial victims. Varro also speaks of human sacrifice to a god equated with Saturn. See, that's Baal. They're sacrificing him to Baal. These can be Canaanites and the or these could be Israelites or a mixture of both. Offered because all of all, all seeds of the human race is the best. I.e. human victims are the most productive of fertility. So they started with animals and they started, you know what, human sacrifices, they give us even more power. Thus, looked at one way, the latter rite was a 
Oh, I'm not trying to say that word again. It was that sort of sacrifice. And another, it was an act of magio religious ritual springing from the old rite of the divine victim. But from both points of view, the intention was the same. The promotion of fertility in field and fold. Divination with the bodies of human victims is attested by Tacitus, who says that the Druids consult the gods and the palpi, uh, palpit, palpitating entrails of men, and by Strabo, who describes the striking down of the victim by the sword and predicting the future from his convulsive movements. To this we shall return. Human sacrifice in Gaul was put down by the Romans, who were amazed at its extent. A Sutinus summing the whole, or I'm not going to read everything. But look, the purpose of the sacrifice, namely fertility, is indicated in the poetic version of the cult of Krom, milk and corn. They would ask from him speedily, in return one third of their healthy issue. So this is why they were doing it. They were doing it, you know, to have a higher uh, cell count in their gonads. That was the best way I could clean that up. Now look at this. The Semites were often considered the worst offenders in the matter of human sacrifice, but in this, according to the classical evidence, they were closely rivaled by the Celts of Gaul. That's because they're one and the same, bro. They offered humans victims on the principle of a life for a life, or to propitiate the gods, or in order to divine the future from the entrails of the victim. We shall examine the Celtic custom of human sacrifice from these points of view first. So I'm going to leave this link in the description. You guys can go check it out. We're going to move on. My throat... Pause, but, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's going away, bro. But Astarte, her symbol was the lion. Right? Now let's move on. Uh... Where does Easter come from? The naming of the celebration as Easter seems to go back to the name of a pre-Christian goddess in England, Oster, who was celebrated at the beginning of spring. The only reference to this god goddess comes from the writings of Venerable Bedi, a British monk who lived in the late 7th and early 8th century. Right. Well, let's find out what Easter actually is talking about. Easter is a pagan festival. If Easter isn't really about Jesus, then what is it then what is it about? Today we see a secular culture celebrating the spring equinox, whilst religious culture celebrates the resurrection. However, the early Christianity made a pragmatic acceptance of ancient pagan practices, most of which we enjoy today as at Easter. The general symbolic story of the death of the sun or sun on the cross constellation of the southern cross and its rebirth overcoming the power of darkness was a well-worn story in the ancient world there were plenty of parallel rivals uh, resurrected saviors too the sumerian goddess inanna or ishtar was a hung naked on the stake and was sub subsequently resurrected and ascended from the underworld do you see that So, Easter is really talking about uh, Ishtar. It's all the same story. It's all the same quote-unquote God, right? Again, when you flip things into right, when you flip righteous things into wickedness, you get you get even more wickedness. The story of the Messiah was something that was known from the beginning of time. That's not something that's new. People knew about that the whole time. But you had certain people, particularly the sons of Japheth, who started this whole thing about, you know, they being the coming of the Son of God and things of that sort. That's that's a different video, bro. Let's keep going. Eggs at Easter. Eggs at company uh, occupy a special status during Easter obs obs observances. They're symbols of rebirth and renewal. Life bursts forth 
from this otherwise plain inanimate object that gives birth uh, gives no hint as to what it contains. In this regard, it is a handy symbol of a resurrection of Jesus Christ, but it is a symbol that has held this meaning long before Christianity adopted it. There is a meme floating around Facebook that some people have ra uh, rallied around and are sharing as a truth of Easter. It proclaims Easter was originally the celebration of, Ish of Ishtar, the Assyrian and Babylonian goddesses of fertility and sex. Her symbols, like the egg and bunny, were and still are fertility and sex symbols. Or did you actually think eggs and bunnies had anything to do with resurrection? After Constantine decided to Christ Christianize the empire, Easter was changed to represent Jesus, but as roots, Easter, which is how you pronounce Ishtar, is all about celebrating fertility and sex. And of course, this article um, is all about, uh, you know, disproving this, right? And it, it's not necessarily disproving it, but when you add both of these together, because they're trying to say, well, you know, it was about love, sex, and war. Ishtar is actually the lion the morning star right but the thing is is that they both come from the same place which is england ishtar or they're at least connected to england ishtar and easter a lot of those a lot of those rites they're connected to england they're connected to stonehenge where the druids were doing a lot of these uh human sacrifices and animal sacrifices they were doing it at stonehenge these are fertility rites they were bastardizing the beginning of the year the new year or the solstices or the equinoxes right so i'm going to skip the star of ishtar uh point because i kind of messed that up i thought that I thought that the star of Ishtar was a seven-pointed star when it was an eight-pointed star. And the Jewish symbol is a seven-pointed star. So, I'm not going to mention that. But, Stonehenge is known for quote-unquote sun worship, right? That's what people say. It's known for stones, right? Stones, hills, and sun worship. That's Stonehenge. And when you, when you look at Gent Hill... We went over this before. I'll go to it real quick. They were hairy and so tall they could walk on the sea and throw walk rocks from one mountain to another. Their stone throwing has led to several tales and explanations for ancient stone buildings and large isolated rocks. See? Anyway, let's get to the last part of this. The unicorn. Now, this is a depiction of the unicorn and pretty much in the middle ages the anglos were hunting the unicorn but why why were they why, why were they hunting and killing all the unicorns <laughs> why would they be doing this man This is a unicorn that these two people are killing. Now, the brother Abdullah Seer, he shared something with me that I want to share with you. His book that he shared with me.
Judai from Dan. As you can see, Dan is an eagle, right? The brigade emblems, whatever. All right, so let's see here. Just so you could see before you buy the book, maybe you might not want to buy it. There goes the horn again. So there you go, there's the horn. This is the unicorn, right? This is referring to Ephraim, but what is re really talking about is Joseph. But Ephraim is the ox, and Manasseh is the unicorn. So I want to show for that. I'm trying to finish this video. Now, what did we just go over? Who was Dan? Dan was the eagle. Manasseh is the unicorn. I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about with Manasseh being the unicorn. According to the Midrash, a unicorn or a Raim was represented on the standard of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. So what is this depicting? Dan has conquered Manasseh. The Danes invaded what? England or Bashan or Manasseh's land. Before the Anglo-Saxons or the sons of Isaac or the Edomites invaded. Right? What is the Mexican symbol, by the way? Hold on. The eagle eating the snake. Is this Dan coming over and conquering? Because... It's not just Dan. Dan is an amalgamation of peoples now. He's mixed in with the other nations. That's why he got he, he's pretty much got kicked out. But Dan is ruling right now. Dan is ruling right now. The Danes invaded England, right? And the symbols of Dan seem to be synonymous with the symbols of America with Babylon with uh with 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 Ishtar with the Phoenicians with England right with the Phoenician or the Dan the Danite lion the snake lion right this is you know what the symbol is depicting this is literally depicting uh you know, the conquering of Israel. Because what is Jacob referred to as a worm or a serpent? Right? That is what Jacob is referred to as. Who comes and apprehends the serpent? The eagle, Babylon, Dan, the tribe of Dan. But who was the tribe of Dan historically? The tribe of Dan mixed in with the Canaanites. Right? We're going to go over that um, probably in the next part. But you can see this, man. It's, a, it's just a similar symbolism. The eagle's over here, overtaking this right here. Right? But here's the thing, bro. Here's the thing. When people think of Mexico, they only think of Issachar. But what they don't realize is that Mexico is actually mostly the land of Joseph. You know, you, you guys know that tree in Mexico, right? El Tul, Arbo del Tul. That's the tree of Moray. In the scriptures, that's Sichem. Oaxaca is Sichem. That is the capital Levitical city of Sichem. And Sichem is in the land of Ephraim. Right? 
when you read this book, Brother of Jared, and you read this chapter, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But chapter 3, it talks about the beef that Dan had with Joseph. Dan actually really hated Joseph more than all of his other brothers. He was the instigator. He really hated Joseph. He had a big problem with Joseph. And to this day, Dan has a problem with Joseph. Because, because honestly, right now, um, Joseph, you would consider them as mostly the people of Mexico, the black Americans, you know, kind of the Caribbeans, like, you know, I know the Taino Indians, they come from Joseph as well, but there are not that many of them for me to make a, a good case for them. But I've noticed that, you know, the people who came over here were a mixture of the tribe of Dan, bro. These white people who seem to hate uh, black people and Mexicans so much, they could be from the tribe of Dan, bro. <laughs> think about that, bro. Maybe that's why they, they, they think that they're Israelites so badly. Because maybe they actually are. By blood. Because Dan was over there in, in, in Western Europe mixing it up. But there's a legend of the unicorn being hunted. And they were using the unicorn for its horn. To the point where there are no more unicorns in England. What are they really talking about? Are they really talking about the tribe of Manasseh? The tribe of Joseph? Because I do recall that they said that if they didn't find the children of of a quote unquote god that they would die they needed to devour us they needed our power they needed us look more symbolism the unicorn and the eagle dan and Manasseh. The unicorn in captivity. From the unicorn tapestries. The unicorn is in captivity. Who put it in captivity? The eagle, Dan, put it in captivity. Dan has a big problem with Joseph. The, the, the unicorn can represent Manasseh or Ephraim, but, you know, that's just what it originally was. But anytime you see a bull or a unicorn, it's representing Joseph. Just think of Joseph. And now, the book that Sudi Face wrote, where she said, Manasseh I led over here, but Ephraim I brought in chains. Hold on. The unicorn in captivity. The hunt for the unicorn is a series of European tapestries dating from the late Middle Ages. This series of seven tapestries now in uh, the Colisters in New York was possibly made or at least designed in Paris uh, at the turn of the 16th century. Okay. Let's move down. One theory is that the tapestries show pagan and, and Christian symbolisms. The pagan themes emphasize the medieval lore of the beguiled lovers, whereas Christian writings interpret the unicorn and his death as the passion of Christ. The unicorn has long been identified by Christian writers as a symbol of Christ. And you know what they do, bro. They take the, the former quote unquote pagan stuff and they Christianize it. Right? That's what they did with Easter. We just read that. <laughs> the original pagan myths about the hunt of the unicorn refer to an animal with a single horn that can only be tamed by a virgin. The Christian scholars translated this to an allegory for Christ's relationship with the Virgin Mary. This just makes no sense at all, bro. But this is how they've gotten a lot of their nonsense. They... They translate our stuff and they don't know what they're talking about. 
But I truly wonder who conquered us. Who truly conquered us? Now I put I put I shared this a, a while with you guys. I'm, I sh I can't even speak anymore, bro. It's real late. Wow, it's all it's over midnight already. Anyway, at the top of this list, it tells you who's really, really running this, bro. The two pillars, but all worship and human sacrifice. What does this go back to? The Canaanites, or AKA the tribe of Dan. They connect to Nimrod, to Babylon, to the pharaohs of Egypt, and to all these different, different peoples. This is a document that my boy Dean, you know, wherever he is, bro. I hope I hope the bro is still alive, bro. <laughs> I've been I've been texting him, man. I don't know where he is. You know, I I need an APB on my bro Dean, but he shared this with me a while ago, right? And he got this from the Moors, right? Now, why am I saying all this? Because this scripture now makes a ton of sense. What do we go over? What was the lion symbolism in England? La-ish. La-ish means lion. Lion, that's the place that Dan took over. And from there, Dan invaded England. Right? And then what did, do, what did Dan do eventually? And Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. La-ish. Lion. He shall leap. From Bashan. Dan shall leap from England. Are we talking about when Britain colonized America? Are we talking about that? Might be. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. And what did they do to, to the natives? To the children of Joseph? What did they do to them? They slaughtered them. Did you know how many of the founding fathers were actually mulattoes? Bet you didn't know that, did you? And of course, you know, some of them did know, some people did know that. There's a video that I was going to play, but I'm really just trying to end this video now. So I'll leave this in the description as well. And it could be, it could have a copyright to it, so maybe I shouldn't play it. But did you know what is the two symbols of England? I showed it earlier. But the two symbols of England are the unicorn and the lion. The tribe of Dan and the tribe of Manasseh or the children of Joseph. Bashan. Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. Are we, uh, come on, bro. Come on, bro. And this is why I brought up Hosea 7 before. Ephraim. He hath mixed himself from among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here, and there upon him. Yet he knoweth not. The pride of Israel is testeth to his face, and they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Ephraim is also like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. As I was thinking, Assyria seems like it's associated with England. It just seems that way. It seems like it's associated with England. Or at least Western Europe somewhere. I've said that a few a few parts ago, but I I don't know, I don't know. When they shall go, I will spread my net upon them. I will bring them down as the fowls of the heaven. I will chasten them, as their congregation have heard. Woe unto them, for they have fled from me. Destruction unto them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I have redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. They could they and they have not cried unto me with their heart when they howled upon their beds. They assemble themselves for corn and wine and rebel against me. Though I have bonded, abound and strengthened their arms, yet do they imagine mischief against me. 
and return, but not to the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow. The princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. They shall be, this shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. So I'm not necessarily fully sure what this is talking about, but is this what this is talking about? The takeover of Ephraim or Joseph? <sighs> I know people think that Cake Not Turned is talking about skin color. That's not what it's talking about, bro. You read the whole chapter. You know, it's talking about like they wait for the baker uh, to put the cake in, right? It's pretty like this chapter is not saying that Ephraim's light skinned. It's saying that Ephraim's a whore, right? <laughs> that's what it's talking about. Anyway, that's what I have. I hope you guys understand where I'm, what point I'm trying to make with all this. I'll leave all links in the description, and you guys can come to your own conclusion, right? So that's all I have. I gotta go to bed. May peace be with you. Say la